Super Bowl champions, Eagles fans everywhere, this is for you. Let the celebration begin. Carson Wentz found some time to get down to Texas and work out with Jalen Rager and a few other receivers. That's a pretty big deal, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, who wants to go to North Dakota? Let's go to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> you bring up some valid points. This is the Eagle Eye Podcast with Ruben Frank and Barrett Brooks. I'm Dave Zangaro. We're going to talk about Carson Wentz working out with Jalen Rager for what we presume is the first time. We'll talk about some COVID-19 guidelines the NFL is trying to to put out there to its teams. We're going to look at some breakout candidates. Among them, Jalen Rager, Isaac Samalu, Derek Barnett. Some challenges facing two new Eagles position coaches and a little bit of Jeff Lurie talk at the end. But we're going to start today with Carson Wentz. We saw him in a video, a quick, short little snippet from Jalen Rager's Instagram account. It looked like certainly Carson Wentz down there with Jalen Rager. It looked like J.J. Arcega Whiteside and then a couple other receivers we couldn't really make out. To me, guys, this is a big deal, especially with the absence of OTAs, getting a chance to work with a rookie receiver who figures to be a pretty big part of this offense. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of value in it. I heard J.J. Arcega Whiteside looks great so far. <laughs> I, I, I heard he's really, really looking sharp. He's having a really good uh, offseason. No, I, and, and uh, I mean, there's so many unknowns right now, but just the fact that I mean, I guess it's the first time they've met each other. I guess it's the first time they've, uh, you know, we don't really know. But uh, anything they can do to, I mean, I, I would think they're running against air, just running some patterns. But I think mean, just the bonding at this point is probably the the, the greatest value, um, you know, and, and getting a feel for, you know, certainly a receiver getting a feel for a quarterback's arm and, and the way the ball comes into him and, um, you know, how hard he throws and that kind of thing. But I think just kind of getting to know each other and, and, uh, and that aspect of it, the bonding aspect, is probably just as big as the football aspect, I would think. You're absolutely right about that. You know what I mean? The, just the bonding effects alone, those guys being able to interact with each other, um, you know, not necessarily the timing because, you know, the plays that they're running, you know, they're on air, so there's gonna, not going to be any defense out there. But just the simple fact that he's now getting used to the speed of how Carson throws the ball. Carson's getting used to the speed of the guy, how he comes out of his breaks, what breaks, what routes he runs better than other routes. Um, you know, just that, that cohesiveness that they need. You know, he hasn't seen this guy. They didn't have the OTAs. They didn't have those, you know, those, those intermittent workouts that they have after they get through running that they usually have during the offseason. Those are all things where you build the tightness as a team, and they're not going to have that. You know, I, I, you know, I referenced it to 2017. Those guys were always together at the beginning of the season, and they built that closeness bond. And as the team went further along uh, during, throughout the process of the, of the season, they built that bond together. Well, they don't have a bond this year. So, you know, it, this is going to be, you know, something for these young guys to just get a little taste of what Carson brings to the table. And Carson can see how fast these guys are and how, you know, how they can be implemented into the offense. Yeah, and, you know, it, we saw the defensive linemen go down to Texas and hang out with Fletcher Cox for a while. Um, all, all this stuff is important. I agree with you guys. It's about, you know, for Carson Wentz, and especially we're looking at Jalen Rager specifically because he, he's the new target. He's a rookie. I think there needs to be a level of trust there um, on both sides. Of it. But really for Carson Wentz to feel like he can trust this rookie and also to get used to his speed. That was something we talked about last year with Deshaun Jackson, and I kind of wondered how long it would take them because, you know, Deshaun's clearly the fastest guy Carson's ever played with. And you thought, well, maybe it's going to be a long process. But you could tell those guys put in the work um, to get on the same page because it's a different kind of animal when you're dealing with that type of speed. Um, so I, I think specifically with a speed receiver, it's important. Um, just Absolutely. for those guys, to th- even on air. You know, even I understand there's not a, a defensive back covering him. I still think it's a big deal. I think it would have been a big deal even if they had OTAs to get the extra work in. And the fact that they don't have OTAs to me makes it even more important this offseason for those guys to find ways within the rules of social distancing and, and being responsible to find ways to, to get some time together and give them credit for, for organizing it. Well, you know, Dave, also you look at – there are little things that a receiver can see about a quarterback and how he throws the ball and the movements in which he throws the ball. And then also Carson can see how this guy's going to come out of his breaks, you know. 
what his body lean is, you know, when he's running, you know, does he have another gear if he throws it? Does he have another gear to go get the ball if he overthrows it? Those are all things he's learning now that, you know, these guys are together so they don't have to worry about this going into camp. They at least know a little bit about each other. And, you know, we joke about J-Jaw, but it's important for him too. I mean, he, you know, it's not just about Rager. Um, yep. he's, he's last year's second-round pick, and they need to get something out of him this year. Uh, it's not like they have depth out the wazoo or wide receivers. So uh, it's big for him to kind of rebuild his confidence and, and kind of start from scratch with Carson. Um, you know, uh, presumably he's healthy now. Whatever was going on with his foot last year is behind him. And, um, and he can go down there and just kind of start over uh, as well because they're going to need him. So if you were one of these guys and Carson says, all right, I'm going to give you the option. We can go to Houston or we can go to North Dakota. Where are you going? <laughs> I'll see you in Bismarck. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a way to Grand Forks, baby. Come on. You and me, I, I, I do not like Houston. I'm telling you. I do not like Houston. It's hot down there, man. But they, they got good food down there from what I hear. Uh, I've only been there. I went to play down there. At the, I played at the Texas Stadium uh, – once or twice, but um, I do do college football on the weekends. And I went down and did a, a Texas A&M game, so I flew into Houston, and it was just like probably a couple of months, you know, you know, after everything that happened down as far as the hurricane, and it was pretty beat up down there. So I really didn't see a lot of what Houston has to offer. So but yeah, I you really did actually. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sit here and let you talk bad about Houston. I lived in Houston for two years. Good people, good food, hot as hell. I mean, it is. I mean, if you're going to train and you're going to try to get your conditioning in, it's not a bad place to do it because you're going to deal with extreme temperatures. Like even now, uh, I'm sure it's in the 90s there. Uh, so it's good from that perspective. Well, didn't I was they down train there. Did they make train down there in, uh, back in, um, back in uh, 2017 where they were eating them buffalo burgers? Maybe they need to go eat some more buffalo burgers so they can win a championship. <laughs> I was down there with. Uh, with Villanova when they won the national title for five or six days. And uh, other than, other than the fact that Villanova was there, we had a lot of fun covering that, man, I couldn't wait to get home. Uh, I'm just <laughs> not a fan. I, it, it, there's nothing there. There's nothing. Well, there. not downtown. It's a Southern city. So there's oh, like, no, not downtown. Yeah. Oh, I, that's why all Southern cities are. I didn't go, go to, to Houston Heights. Well, go to, go to Atlanta and try to do something downtown or go to Charlotte and try to do something. There's just not much there. Does it? Does Houston have the equivalent of like Buckhead? Yeah, <laughs> it does. Imagine it. Yeah, definitely. There's gray right. areas in Houston. I missed them. They were closed when I was there. Well, anyway. and then like, and then blues down there. I know you. You. You know, you're a musician. You love. You know, blues and things of that nature. I thought that you know they had like one of those up and coming type of uh, musical Houston? type of towns. Houston. Yeah. The only blues I heard were the ones I was singing. To try to get out of there. <laughs> I just don't like Houston. They still got the Astrodome, though. They, they haven't torn down the Astrodome. Well, it's sitting there right next to Energy Stadium, whatever they're calling it these days. It might tear itself, it might tear itself down. That's what it might <laughs> It's do. a mess. People in I, Houston love that Astrodome. It's all fenced. It's got all kind of asbestos and stuff in it. Yeah, I, cover, I, covered the, I covered the 91 game there. I oh, that the was House, a great game. I covered the House of Pain game. All right. We're going to move on from Carson and, and Jalen Rager and, and a good city. Houston, Texas. Uh, we love you, Houston. Um, moving on, I, this is – so the whole reason the guys are down there is because um, right now is about the time they'd be wrapping up mini camp, And, of course, no OTAs this year. It looks like no mini camps of any sort. The first time everyone will be back in the building at the Novacare Complex will be for training camp. So it, it brings up a, a big question about how the league is going to handle this. Roger Goodell sent out a memo to all 32 teams just a couple of days ago outlining some of those points. Uh, we can go through some of them. Um, it, it's just that it seems really difficult and almost impossible for teams to abide by all of these rules. And we don't have to go through all of them, but specifically the social distancing ones I mean, they seem almost impossible. The, the memo asks when possible for lockers to be spaced out six feet apart. Guys, we've all spent a lot of time in those lockers. And every, there's not a locker room in the NFL that has that kind of space. So unless you're talking about having other spaces set up as locker rooms, maybe they can use Lincoln Financial Field 
locker rooms to separate, but it, the logistics of this seem really difficult right now. Yeah, especially because you have 90 guys on the roster right now. So if you used every other locker, you need 180 lockers. <laughs> they <don't>, right. <laughs> they, don't have, they don't have 180 lockers. And, um, you know, they have different tiers of, of personnel, um, support personnel, coaches, players, medical personnel. They're not supposed to mix unless it's absolutely mandatory. I read those, those guidelines, and I'm with you, Dave. I, I, I don't know how it's realistically possible to, to follow them. And I understand their guidelines. These aren't laws. But I don't know. I'm, I don't know how they're going to make it work. i got to be honest. Um, I don't know how they're going to make it work short of, you know, a vaccine being available or testing, getting to the point where you have 100%, you know, results, um, you know, accuracy with results, and, and you can get immediate results. So going into the building, you test people. Because they're testing people's temperature – I mean, you could be, you could have it and be a week away from having a fever. So I'm not sure right. what that's accomplishing. So short of a vaccine or having some sort of testing where you can get an immediate result. All right, you're going in the building, you're clear. You, you don't have it. And everybody in the building knows they don't have it. Everybody on the practice field knows they don't have it. Everybody in the games. Short of that, I, I, honestly, I don't know how they're going to do this. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, and, and looking from a player's standpoint, I mean, you know, you talk about the logistics of being in that locker room and, and being six, weeks, six feet away from, from each guy. Well, I mean, when you're on that field, you know, and, you know, as we get into this, as an offensive lineman and a defensive lineman, you are touching each other every single play. There is body fluids flying everywhere. You're bumping it. Gr- that kind of sounds like not football, <laughs> right? But, but I'm just saying it's, it's a lot that's involved with, you know, this sport, you know, you're pushing guys around. You're going to get that intimate contact with these guys every single play when you're an offensive lineman and a defensive lineman, a linebacker, a running back. So, I mean, if one guy has it, I mean, it's going to spread like wildfire because just the nature of how these guys are so intimate and close during practice time. Yeah, and I, I guess the, the biggest fear, and it seems like the way these tiers are set up is that, you know, the players are tier one the players and like some coaches, head strength and conditioning coaches, equipment managers, the people who absolutely need to be there are tier one. And it seems like their whole goal is to keep those people away from the other tiers of people as much as possible, which I understand. Is that us? Is that us? They go to three tiers, Barry. We're like tier 20. Yeah. We're, 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 we didn't even make, we're, we're so far down on these we tiers. Don't, we don't even have a tier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's going to uh, be, that's, yeah, that's a, that's legit. Where we fit in on that? You know, we would like to see what's going on with our team. You know, we need we to don't. for our team. Yeah. I mean, we, it's pretty simple. We don't, we don't fit in there. And I understand that for now that, uh, look, I'm not going to be the guy complaining about access right now because it's, they've got to figure out a way to, to get the product on the field. And even that to me is like, it's, it's hard to imagine this going smoothly and that's not a knock on them because I feel like they're trying to take the right steps. But even just think about day, day of a game. And I think we've talked about this before, but how many people need to be in a stadium to have a football game? Right. A lot. A lot. We're talking 55 guys on each team. Then how many coaches on each team? 20 coaches? So you're up to yep. 40 coaches. So now you're, you're over 100 people just with the absolute bare minimum players and coaches. Then you have trainers, equipment guys, referees, staff from the stadium. So I, I don't know the, the answer to this question, but I imagine it's in near at least 1,000 people, right? Ballpark need to be in minimum. a stadium for a game? Absolute minimum. minimum. Yeah. You know, not even counting us, you know, covering the game to get the game out to the masses. I mean, this is going to be a really difficult situation for, you know, all these things, not just football, but, you know, the other sports also. But, I mean, just football is just so much more different than a lot of, you know, these games because it's such a physical type of game. And, you know, I, it's going to be tough, man, but we have to find some way, man. Where is this? Where's this vaccine at? Where's this vaccine at? Damn it, give me a vaccine. <laughs> I'm working on it, Barrett. I'll let you know. <laughs> I mean, there are, some, there are some encouraging signs on that front and, you know, just hopeful that, that they pan out stuff that they're testing now. But, um, 
you know, and, and you know, you don't, that's not even including like if they're going to televise these games, uh, you know, there's got to be people operating the cameras and directors yep. and, you know, all that stuff, um, all the tech stuff. And just to make the, the scoreboard work, you know, cause you're going to need, you know, everyone who's playing is going to need to know what down it is. So there's mm -hmm. uh yeah, there's, there's a lot. Uh, and I, I think, I think everything other than the players, you can kind of, I mean, everybody's got their own booth upstairs, even like maybe there'll be more coaches up in the booth. Maybe there'll be, you know, there's going to be different booths. I would guess media wise, there'll be like pool reporters. Maybe they'll let 10 media in per game. I mean, it's a big press box. You can get 20 people in there. Nobody will be within 10 feet of each other. Uh, but I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know how realistic it is. And, and part of it is, you know, we're, I mean, we're not that far. We're, you know, we're sitting here. There's going to be preseason games scheduled in like 10 weeks, you know, wow. so. Um, uh, or less than that, I guess, you know, so um, they're going to have to figure out a lot of things very quickly. And I, you know, I hate to be so pessimistic, but I don't see how this is going to happen without huge strides in the next couple of months as far as testing, uh, if not a vaccine. I mean, well, the good thing for the this. NFL is you have other leagues, you know, granted they'll be different and like the NBA is having a single, um, single area. Is that what they're calling it? Single. Yeah. Single. But also you have five guys playing basketball, you know, it's true. Yeah, and the so contact yeah. isn't as significant as in football. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this though. Look at this though. I mean, you, woo, six degrees of separation. We're not even talking about six feet, but six degrees of separation. You know, you have family members. These guys are going home to their families. You know, it's not like the basketball where they're going to be in Disney and they're going to be, you know, in that confined area. Well, right. they don't have confined area here that, the, you know, these players will be around their family members who, you know, might be around somebody else who might be around somebody else that might have it, you know. I mean, it's, six degree of separation is just what I'm worried about. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think if, if they really want to enforce social distancing and six feet of separation, they should bring Ronald Darby back maybe. <laughs> <laughs> He never got within six feet of receiver all last year. He was ahead of his time. <laughs> he was a trailblazer. Yeah. But, no, and, and you know, I, I don't know if they could sequester the players. You can sequester players in, in, the, in the Marriott for 17 weeks. I, I don't know if you can do that. Right. Um, it's a big I ask. Know. I mean, especially a lot of these guys have families. You're going to, like, ask them not to spend time with their families for months? Right. Or just, you know – so somehow social distance when you're home. And I, I don't know. I don't know how it's practical. I don't know how it's realistic. I know they're working on these helmets that have, um, the, the, I guess the special material that the masks are made of that are going to cover like the, the front of the helmet. And they think those will, those will help, but I, I don't know. I wonder about breathability in those. I mean, Barry, right. you played with, I mean, could you imagine having something in front of your face? No, like I, that? I remember I had hurt my eye. And um, I had to wear a shield. And it was just a shield over my eyes. And it was hard for me to breathe in that. You know, I'm a fat guy, man. I need all the air I can get. And let alone having a mask around or something constructing my breathing, trying to get all the air I can in. I mean, that's going to be a, a, a terrible situation for guys, man. I mean, you know, and then they have these young – you have young guys that, you know, still want to go out and party and do everything they do. You know what I mean? I mean, how are they going to use social distancing when they're at strip clubs, man? Come on, man. I mean, what, what, what's going on, bro? You know, how do you go social distance from that, bro? <laughs> I'm going to keep my comments. <laughs> yeah, I'm staying away <laughs> to myself on that one. Stay away from um, that. I'll tell you, that's not the best industry for social distancing. I'll leave it there. Um, oh, another part of this, though, was that it, there, it says that when possible, try to have all your meetings virtually, which I guess they have a, a jump on right now. But we've talked about the importance of camaraderie in a team. And I wonder how that affects everything. You know, you can, you can get some of that virtually. You know, we're, we're laughing, joking right now, but it's not the same as if we're in the same room. And um, limiting that, I don't, I don't even know how you limit that during a week. Say you're at a week of practice, you're all practicing together. You're working out in the weight room and now you're going to have virtual meetings. You send everyone home. You say, all right, mm. guys, we'll have a meeting in, in a half hour. Go home. We'll do it there. I, there, there are still so many logistical questions to, to answer and not a lot of time, honestly. We're, we're getting close to, I mean, the end of July is typically where training camp starts. Um, and, and there's been some reports that maybe the NFL will try to do something before then, especially for medical checks. There's been some reports about that. 
That's coming up pretty quick. I mean, it seems like it's far away, but it really isn't at this point. We're already at June 9th. Um, it seems like there, there are a lot of questions to answer until we get to that point. Preseason opener is two months away. I don't know how they're going to play that. I don't know how this is going to work. I hope it does. I mean, because I can't imagine uh, a season without football. Maybe it'll start late. Maybe there'll be some breakthroughs as far as testing over the next, um, you know, eight to ten weeks. Uh, and if there are, then, you know, I'd, I'd be really optimistic. But um, they got a lot, a lot of questions to answer. You know what I mean? It's, it's – it's... This is crazy we're going through this time. I, mean, I would never have thought that there was a chance that we wouldn't have a football season because of an outbreak like this. But, I mean, realistically, I, I, it's hard for me to really imagine, you know, keeping these guys from, you know, social distancing when you're always around each other. I mean, you're, you're, you're close, tight-knit groups. These guys are not going to be six feet away from each other. I mean, they're just not going to do it. They're going to be around each other. You know how close those guys are in the locker room. And especially that locker room there at the facility we're at, I mean, it's 53 guys in there with the, with the 10 practice squad guys, and it feels like we're all bunched up in there, let alone 90 guys. You know, it's just going to be a, you know, a, a totally crazy situation over there. Your NBC Sports Philadelphia podcast now on the My Teams app. Everybody listen to Eagle Eye, Sixers Talk, Phillies Talk, and Flyers Talk today on the My Teams app. All right, guys, now we're going to pretend like Nothing else is going wrong, and we're going to have an NFL season because we need it. And we're going to talk about some breakout candidates. We, we got to some last week. We have a few more. Uh, we're going to start with Jalen Rager, the guy we talked about at the top of the podcast. I think there are some decent expectations for him entering year one. Uh, how realistic do you think it is that he can actually have a quote-unquote breakout season as a rookie? I think he's going to be okay. Uh, I think it's, it's easy to just – you know, because it's been such a, a rough time for Eagles receivers lately. It's easy to just kind of lump him in that and assume it'll be the same. And I know there's a lot of negative reaction to the pick. I wasn't in love with the pick. I wanted Jefferson. But that said, I think the kid's okay, and, and I think he'll be all right. I don't think he's going to be a disaster. Um, I'd like to see him catch, you know, 45 to 50 passes. I, I don't think that's outrageous. He's certainly going to have the opportunity. You know, I mean – I mean, I don't know what they're going to get out of Deshaun. Even if Alshon does play, it won't be at the beginning of the year. You know, Greg Ward in the slot. You know, you have you have Jay Jaw. There's going to be plenty of opportunities for the kid to play. So I, I think he'll be okay. I, I don't think he's going to be rookie of the year, but I don't think he's going to be a disaster either. I think he'll be he'll be okay. You know, guys, with the odds are saying that you know, looking at him to have right around 45 to 50 catches and the 700 yards. Hell, I'd have wanted our starting receivers last year to have numbers really close to that, you know. But, you know, the expectation is that he's going to come in and, and contribute to this offense. I don't know necessarily how. I mean, you know, we, Doug is going to use him in a lot of different ways. You know, he's going to be, you know, running tunnel screens. He's going to be running reverses, you know, stuff like that. But I really think he's also a guy that could take the top off the defense. He's that fast that he could create separation at the top of routes. So I think he's going to open up things a little bit. So, you know, at least, you know, if he can go out there and make himself a threat in this offense, it gives this offense, you know, a chance to open up a lot more at the edge, especially in the middle of the field where Ertz can work and Miles Sanders can run the ball and, and, you know, work in the middle of the field. Yeah, I like what you said there, Barrett, because I think that Rager is explosive enough. And I was kind of with you, Rube. I, I really like Jefferson because I, I liked – having a high floor guy, I, I'm pretty confident that Jefferson is going to at least be a good NFL player. And yes. with Rager, we've talked about this a bunch. There's a, a boom bust factor to Rager, but the boom part of it is this kid is so explosive that if I'm Doug Peterson, I'm going to find ways to get him the ball. Um, so I think a lot of that could come in the screen game. It can come by designing plays for him. What I hope they don't do is what they did with Jay jaw last year and say, well, you play this position and there's already someone in front of you with this position, so you got to sit on the bench. And I hope they don't do that with Jalen Rager. I hope they don't say, hey, you're our Z receiver. Sorry, that's what Deshaun plays, and he's ahead of you, so you're not going to play. We're going to go with Deshaun and then whoever's the X, whether it's Alshon or J-Jaw or whoever it is. And sorry, you're going to have to wait because um, I, I think that they can find ways to get him involved without overloading him. You know, I think that was their fear with J-Jaw last year is we'll teach you one position, we'll bring you along slowly, and I understand all that, but I think there's an opportunity here 
to use Jalen Rager on those bubble screens. I think you can use him in the slot at yep. times and have a more explosive option in the slot than a Greg Ward who's more dependable and less less explosive. So I, I, I hope that Doug Peterson gets creative with Jalen Rager because he has a skill set, I think, that can make that really work. Isn't it amazing? You look back at last year, they had we – we, we had Matt Collins, Nelson Aguilar, and J.J. Arcega Whiteside. I mean, <laughs> and, and Carson threw for 4,000 yards. What's he going to throw for with, with legit receivers? 6,000? Mm. Well, we got to see if they have legit receivers. I mean, that's a big question. Um, and, and Rager's a big part of that. If, if he has a good rookie season, I, mean, I think he's a big key to this team, not just this year, but going forward. Uh, because y- you'd like to have Carson grow with a young receiver. Carson should be in the prime of it. He's 27, right? He should be in the prime of his career. And the receivers, we're going to talk about the receiver position later, but he hasn't really had that young guy to grow with. I guess the closest he's gotten is Nelson Aguilar, and that didn't work out. Um, so well, you know, Donovan never had that. You know, Donovan, I think it's, it's, it's you know, even Randall. I mean, he had Fred Barnett, I guess, um, you know, for, for a couple of years. But, you know, he never had that guy that was that perennial, you know, star receiver. Donovan never had it. They've never had that, you know, that Peyton Manning, Marvin Harrison thing, that Steve Young or, you know, Jerry Rice, Joe Montana, Jerry Rice thing, Troy Aikman, Michael Irvin thing, where their they're great quarterbacks and their great receivers have never lined up, mainly because they've never had great receivers. But, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, that's what you want. That's the ideal. I mean, that's, I mean, that's an unstoppable combination. They got the one part of it. They just, they just haven't been able to get the other part of it. Yeah, the closest right, thing we have to that is, uh, what, you know, him and Ertz. You know, if he has somebody besides Ertz to open up this offense, it could really, really pay dividends for this offense, man. I mean, I, you know, having a guy to stretch the field and having an opportunity to a guy that can really run and create separation. I mean, Carson has had to throw perfect balls to his receiver. He has to throw a perfect ball to Alshon Jeffrey, a perfect ball to J, uh, J, J. R. Thigga Whiteside. He has to throw perfect balls to him. I think the closest he got that was Greg Ward. He could go out there and he could, you know, create some separation and then go get the ball at times. We didn't have that last year once D-Jack stepped off the field. So, um, hopefully we'll have that with these new receivers we have with Goodwin and Rager. The slowest receiver on the team was the only guy who could uh, get separation. (laughs) (laughs) That's never a good thing. Uh, The next player on the list is Isaac Sayamalu. Um, And – I, I like Isaac Samuel. I think he's a solid player. Um, I think he's an inconsistent player. And I think in order for him to have a, a breakout season, he just needs to be more consistent. Where are you guys on Isaac right now? I like Isaac. You know, I mean, he's consistent. And that's what we want, consistent players. As an offensive lineman, you never want to hear your name called when you're on the field. I had an opportunity to have my name called an awful lot on the field, whether it be holding or jumping off sides. But he's consistent enough that you don't hear his name. They don't worry about running the ball his way. He can go out there. He can do that. He pass blocks pretty well. He's a consistent guy. Now, is he going to turn on, turn the light on and be that all-pro guy, you know, or, or a pro bowler? I don't know. But he might have to because the guy to the left of him – we don't know yet if he's a player or not. He might have to um, go out there and really help this young guy out a lot. And the only way he can do that is if he's so solid at his position, then he can help on the outside. If he's not and he's struggling just a little bit, that left side can really, you know, hurt this team. Yeah, I think Sayamalo had a breakout year last year, honestly. I, I think um, he wasn't perfect, and you know, but I, I thought he was pretty solid. I, I thought he played well. Um, I think they're in good hands at left guard with, with Isaac. And, um, you know, he, he, uh, he's had some ups and, ups and downs early in his career, but I, I think he had the breakout year last year. I'm, pr- I'm pretty good with Isaac right now. Yeah, I generally am too. I think the perception of Isaac hasn't caught up to the player he's become. And he's not a great player, but, um, yeah, but still, on the flip side of that, you know, week two in Atlanta, I give him all the credit in the world for bouncing back from that game, but that game can't happen. I mean, that, that's about as bad as a guard can play in this league. And it, it puts your quarterback in a situation where he's fearing for his life. You just can't have games like that. Um, 
and, and don't get me wrong, I, I give him all the credit in the world for bouncing back from that. And Barrett's right. I mean, aside from some horrendous performances, he's been really consistent. But you just can't have those outliers in there. Um, and I, I think that what we saw in the, the end of, of last season, the last 13 games, we saw that consistency. Uh, and that's a great sign. I think he has the potential to eventually – I think he has Pro Bowl type potential because he's he's a pretty athletic player. He he's pretty strong too. You know, yeah, he, is. he came into this league and everyone said he he's a, a future center. I see enough strength from him that guard might be his long term position at this point. And he can play offense. tackle. You know, he can get you through a game of tackle too. Um, yeah, I mean, he can play anywhere on the line. He's got a hell of a coach. Um, you know, when you, he's going to be a pro bowler at some point in his career. I mean, uh, guys come here and, I mean, this is a franchise that never had any pro bowl offensive linemen, you know, for until Jermaine, I think, ended the streak or, uh, or Trey ended the streak. I guess Jermaine was here before Trey, but that whole era. And then now, you know, you got J.P. Brooks, um, you know, Trey and Runyon uh, pro bowlers. Obviously, Kelsey's, you know, been a bunch. And – uh you know, Lane Johnson, three in a row. So uh, that's the expectation. And uh, I, I think he's that kind of player. I, I think, yeah, I think once he has that consistency, uh, he'll have a chance to be a pro bowler. I really do. And I think some of it is a little unfair to him just because he's playing next to – I mean, he was on a line last year with four guys who have made multiple pro bowls. You're talking about right, – yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jason Peters is a Hall of Famer. Jason Kelsey's – a borderline, maybe a Hall of Famer. Brandon Brooks might be the best right guard in football. Lane Johnson is the best right tackle in football. So I, I guess by comparison, he's the weakest link from last year's. Not anymore, he's line. not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out about that soon enough. Yeah. The, bar is there, yeah, the bar is so high for him that you have to look at him like, I mean, he played damn good. It's just the guys around him played even better. <laughs> exactly. Um, the next one is – our favorite topic on Eagle Eye, <laughs> uh, Derek Barnett. And he's another one. And Rube's going to he, – he's already rolling his eyes because I think the perception of Barnett has not caught up to the player he is. And that's not to say Barnett's a star because he's not. But he's not a bust either. I, I think he's a solid NFL starter who's still young enough that you can consider him a breakout candidate even though he's been in the league since 2017. Yeah, I don't know what it says about a guy when I mean, he's going into year four and he's consideration for a breakout candidate. Um, uh, yeah, he's only 23, so he's got that going for him. The injuries concern me. It's been a, a real pattern of injuries. 14 sacks in three years is not what I'm looking for from a top 15 pick, first half of the first round. Uh, but that said, you know, and, uh, you know, six sacks the last 10 games that he played last year is encouraging. If he can do that over a full year, you know, you have a double digit sack guy. Um, but you know, when you're the 14th pick, you got to be a, a 12 to 15 sack guy. We haven't seen that yet. He's okay, but he's not the player I think he needs to be. And I need to see him more of a variety. I need to see, I need to see him stay healthy. I need to see him cut down on the penalties, be a more disciplined player. I need to see more of a variety of, in pass rush moves. Cause I just don't think he has enough of an arsenal, uh, to beat the better tackles. And what you said right there is just really, if you put it on his resume, that's what you read. I mean, he had, you know, when he was coming out of Tennessee, he had all the pass rush moves in the world. He was the most polished pass move got, rush guy, you know, out of the, you know, guys come out of jail. Miles Garrett and then was him. And I really had higher expectations on him. He has great ankle bend when he's going around the corner. He had NFL pass rushing move. He had worked with Chuck Smith all those years, you know, great defensive end from Atlanta. And really, I really thought that that was going to help him take that next step of be somebody opposite of Brandon Graham to be a really good pass rusher. Well, it didn't come to fruition just yet. And I, you, just like you said, injuries is the biggest thing. But I love his aggressive nature. If he cuts down on the penalties, stays consistent and, 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 and stays on the field instead of getting hurt, I truly believe that he's going to have an opportunity this year because there's a lot of other attention that's going to go to other guys. You have to now look at the guys in the middle. They have legitimate guys that can press the pocket. You look at Brand, um, Brandon Graham on the other side. He's going to get his, you know, four or five sacks simply because he just goes so damn hard. And then you got Fletcher Cox. So he has an opportunity because there's going to be a lot of tension pressed away from him to get the one-on-ones he needs to be guys. And hopefully he takes advantage of them. 
All right, moving on to two new faces in, in the Eagles building this year. Defensive backs coach Marquand Manuel, Roger Severs coach Aaron Moorhead. Those two guys have quite a job in front of them this year. We're talking about the two biggest positions of need entering this offseason, and now they don't have an offseason to work on it. I guess we'll start with Marquand Manuel in the defense. Cornerback guys – it's been a big problem for this team for many years now. Yeah, and, and I wrote about that today, just the, the turnover. I, you know, they haven't had a quarterback start 10 games, 10 games, two years in a row since Nolan Carroll. I mean, you know, it's, wow. it's uh, the, the lack of stability, the lack of consistencies, the, the lack of production, the lack of health. There's so many things that have gone into it um, and the changes. So you got a new coach. Um, and I personally thought uh, Corey Unlin was a very good coach. I, I think he'll do well, and I, I, I think a lot of him. What he did without a lot of talent, being able to cobble that thing together year after year, there was guys coming in and playing off the practice squad, off the street. And, you know, but I, I think that with Darius Slay, you know, you got, you got a lot of moving pieces. You got Slay coming in. You got Avante moving outside. You got Jalen moving to safety. Um, you know, you have another guy, Will Parks, who's new at, at safety. You have uh, Nikel Roby Coleman coming in to play the slot. Um, there's so many new pieces that it, it almost seems like uh, a new team. So without OTAs, with all these people in new positions, um, you know, you're seeing all these guys coming in like Slay and Parks and Roby Coleman, guys like Rasul Douglas, most likely on the way out. Maddox and Jalen Mills changing positions. Sydney, who knows? It's just a, it's a, it's a position in, you know, in, in flux right now. And that's one heck of a challenge for, uh, for Mark Manuel, who, you know, I, I think from, you know, just from what I know about him as a player and what he did in Atlanta. And I, I think he's, uh, I think he's a good coach, but that's, uh, that's not an easy ask. Absolutely. I mean, it's going to be tough for him. Meaning, I mean, does Schwartz change his, his defensive philosophies now that he now has corners that can cover? I mean, that's going to be a, you know, huge thing. I want to see how they're going to go out there. Are we still going to run that damn picket fence? I mean, <laughs> I'm going to lose my mind if we run that still because he now has the players that can follow. I like the picket fence. It always works. <laughs> it always works. <laughs> it, it's, it works every time. It's a great play on third and 35. <laughs> right. <laughs> hold, hold him to 31 yards. But, um, no, I, mean, I think he'll be more aggressive. I think certainly – I mean, they haven't had a cornerback like Slay since Asante, let's be honest. So, I think that it's going to afford him the ability to, to you know, to blitz because he can trust those guys, um, you know, especially Slay. But I, I don't know what kind of outside corner Avante is going to be. I don't know physically at 5'9", how he's going to hold up. Uh, he's certainly got the talent. He's aggressive. He's, you know, he, he's around the ball. Um, I think he's got a chance to be a player, but uh, I, th- I still think his best position's inside. But um, you know, he'll he'll be ta- you know he'll he'll be dealing with the other team's second best receiver, so that's that's going to help. But I do think Jim's going to be a more aggressive coach, certainly with these corners. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and I think Mills moves in um, in- into that like box safety slash guy that's going to be around a line of scrimmage. I mean, because he's an aggressive player, and that's what he wants to do. He wants to play aggressive, so. Him being a guy that's going to be in the box, you know, you know, coming up with making tackles, making sure, you know, that he's uh, on tight ends now and, and running backs out of the backfield. I think that's really going to suit him well as a player in the back end. But now that, you know, I, I think he is going to be – Coach Schwartz is going to be a lot more aggressive because I think he has some horses in the middle of that defense also, the defensive line, which is going to generate a lot more pressure also. Yeah, I, I wonder about schematically too how much – they're going to change because um, they have a coach now with a, a background with the zone and you wonder about how many of those concepts are going to carry over. And you would think quite a few um, just based on his history. Uh, and now you have a, a, a really short off season to figure that right. out. Uh, I, I kind of agree with you, Ruba. I think my biggest concern right now about the secondary is probably Avante at that outside corner spot. Um, we've seen good and bad from Avante. I don't know what to expect. Um, I think that they'd probably love for Sidney Jones to show up and win that job, but I don't know how realistic that is. Uh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but having Darius Slay is a big deal. It really is. It can change a lot of what they do. So if he's able to stay healthy and be on the field, 
they have a shot here. I mean, he, he's – Corey Unlin's got to be like, you gotta, you're kidding me, right? I didn't have a good corner <laughs> in my, what, five years in Philly. I get to Detroit, and our, my only good corner ends up going to Philly. <laughs> right. right. That's insane. All right, let's move on to Aaron Moorhead and the receivers. Uh, one and 1A one in terms of the weakest positions on this team coming out of last year. A lot of the receivers – last year because of injury, but even before then, it's not like they had great receivers. I mean, Alshon had his moments, Nelly had his moments, but they haven't had great receivers. And as many receivers as they've gone through, they've almost gone through as many receivers coaches. Uh, Moorhead will be the fifth in five years under Doug Peterson. It seems like it's an uphill battle for whoever gets this job to make it work. The, the parallels between secondary or cornerback and wide receiver – are, are amazing. I mean, you know, they're, they're both positions that they've, they've missed on draft picks. They've missed on free agents. They've cobbled together guys that have had some moments, but have ultimately been disappointing. Um, they've had huge turnover this past off season at both spots and they have a new coach at both spots. And they're two of the most important positions in the modern NFL passing attack. So um, there's really a, a, a parallel there. And, um, you know, I, I think Howie understood that those are the two pressing needs going into the off season, and they certainly made big changes at both. Um, but you know, let's see what happens because there's still a lot of unknowns there. Yeah, and I, I think you know that I think they're going in the right direction um, at the wide receiver position by getting more speed on the field. Andy Reid gave him the blueprint on how to you know play this game, and that's getting speed on the outside. And now with Goodwin out there, d comes back healthy. That's speed. Rager has some speed with him. You know, Hightower is, you know, I don't know, you know, either Hightower or, or Watkins, which one's going to make the team. But they have speed, legitimate speed, now that you have to respect on the defensive side of the ball. So, you know, I, I think, you know, his job will be a little more, just a little more easier than, um, you know, the last, you know, couple of receivers because he didn't have any speed at first. You know, d was the fastest guy we've had in, what, last five years? But, yeah, but I mean, Hightower, there's a reason these guys were, were late-round draft picks. You know, right. Quez and, and Hightower. Deshaun, can he stay healthy? Uh, Goodwin, can he stay healthy? Can, you know, is he still the player? I mean, it's been a while since he had a big year. So they're all guys on paper who have speed, but right. they got to be on the field or that speed doesn't mean anything. That speed doesn't help you in the trainer's room, six feet away from your teammates. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good point, though. There's some talent there, but not a lot of it is proven. And the, the proven talent that they have, no guarantee those guys stay healthy. So it's probably still a pretty important job for Aaron Moorhead. But I, I even think about, you know, we talked about Jalen Rager getting a chance to grow with Carson Wentz. Think about Jalen Rager getting a chance to grow with the receivers coach. I, I think to, to Nelson Aguilar, he was here six years or five years, he had five different receivers coaches. It, it's kept hard. Running, they kept quitting, you say. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to expect players to develop under those types of – and I'm not saying that's the reason Nelson Aguilar didn't become a first-round pick, but it's, it certainly didn't help. Carson Walsh got a job yet? I don't think so. I think he's available. Is he? <laughs> no, it, it, you know, it's hard to develop, it, you know. I, there's no question about it. And – uh you know, I think – and I think Grove did a good job as receivers coach, you know, but obviously, um, he, you know, he was he was one and done. They won a Super Bowl as one year doing that. Um, but, yeah, the, I mean, Greg Lewis and, I mean, Gunter Brewer. I mean, it's been uh, – it's been quite a parade of, of, uh, of candidates coming in. I mean, you remember what I said to you after we talked to Carson Walsh in the auditorium on, on assistant coach day? I said, and he walked out. He walked out, and I think that was the day he was he was trying to defend Matt Collins, playing him seventy snaps a game. And uh, I said to you, we'll never see him again. <laughs> You're right, and we never saw him again. We never. All right, saw we're going to finish this podcast uh, with a chance for room to plug a story. It was a good one. Um, Jeff Laurie has been here for an awful long time, and you had to try to go through and narrow down his accomplishments to the top 10. How difficult was that? Well, you know, seven or eight of them were pretty, were pretty cut and dry, but I, I think my initial list had like 15. 
um, yeah, I had fun with it. And, and, you know, starting with day one, the day he was, he, you know, he took over the team, he hired Joe Banner, which, um, you know, like Joe or not, what, you know, his influence continued with this team to today, the way he kind of got Howie prepped for the job, his, you know, his, his groundbreaking work with the salary cap and, and, and all that, um, you know, and, and all the way through to firing chip when, you know, not waiting another year, uh, you know, hiring Doug. So there's a lot, you know, a lot of things like that. I wanted to ask Barrett, cause I think, you know, Jeff Lurie has been here 25, 26 years, bought the team. It was, it was finalized during the 94 season. So 95 was really his first, uh, his first year, which was Barrett's first year as well. You guys came yep. in together. How have you seen Jeff change over the years um, a, as an owner, you know, as far as maybe not being as hands-on in some areas? And, you know, what, what have you seen from him? You know, he was very influential. Uh, you know, it, it, he was greatly influenced by others uh, when he first got into the league. He wanted to be like this guy. He wanted to be like this guy. Well, I think he changed as far as how he approaches his team. It's his team, and he runs it the way Jeffrey Lurie wants to run it. And I, I like that aspect of it. You know, he said that he wanted to be the gold standard. So what did he do? He set out to doing that. You know, he got, you know, rid of the vet. You know, he left the vet. He changed the colors. He changed – all the mindsets on how Philly fans thought of this Philadelphia Eagles team. And, you know, you have to commend him for that. Um, I like how he's starting to integrate, you know, older guys like myself and veteran players into the system, you know, so they can see, all right, there's a pattern that they, you know, they can rely on now that, all right, we see the young guys now, the young guys see the older guys, and he's bridging that gap between them. So I think, I think Lurie is really – set out to be his own guy. He's not patterning himself out of anybody after anybody anymore. And he's become one of the owners, one of the elite owners in the league just for his hard work and really doing it the way he wanted to do it. Yeah. And, and I think, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting. You look at him now, he's owned the team 26 years. Um, I think Leonard Toast had the longest ownership before him, which was 15 years. So it's 10 years longer than anybody else. Uh, you can make a case that he's the most influential person in Eagles history. I mean, he, you know, yeah. he's owned the team for a third of their existence. Um, so it's, uh, um, I, I think he's always wanted to do the right thing. Um, you know, he didn't always have the right people to kind of carry that out, but, um, considering where the franchise was when, when he bought it, Kotai was the coach practicing at the vet. You remember, remember it was like, remember those locker rooms and the, remember the weight oh room. Oh my at the God. Vet? <laughs> tell, tell, tell everyone about the weight room at the vet. I mean, you know what? My bedroom is bigger than the weight room that was at the back. <laughs> it, it was in a hallway, you know. I think they used to park, uh, you know, cars in it. I mean, not cars, but uh, those little uh, golf carts in it. And, you know, it was terrible. It was just a terrible place to, as a player to be in. I can remember Juan Castile walked out of the locker room, going to the meeting room that was crossed the way, and got hit by a car and shattered his knee open. What if yeah. it had been a player? You know, um, yeah, he got he got uh, there was there was he he got a lot of money for that. <laughs> he got a big settlement. Yeah, he got a wow. big settlement from that. Yeah, that was um, that was awful. And uh, yeah, it was a dungeon down there. And uh, you know, Ray the Rose, we walked in. Oh yeah. Well, John Harbaugh <laughs> tells a story about John Harbaugh that the day he got hired. This is a guy who's a career college coach, and. Uh, I know we're off topic. Dave's giving me that look like, shut up. <laughs> Harbaugh, Harbaugh had gotten hired and he was going to do a press conference the next day or whatever. And he was at a hotel down by the airport. And it was like two in the morning. He was so excited. He couldn't sleep. So we drove up to the vet. He's like, I just want to kind of just check out the stadium. And he saw that the door was open. It was like three in the morning. He just walked in the door. There's no security there. There was that old guy. You know, right. he, he walks in. There's nobody there. He just walks downstairs. He goes into the coach's offices. Everything's unlocked. And he sits down at his desk. And he's just sitting there thinking, wow, I'm in the NFL. And all of a sudden, there's this noise. And it's getting louder and louder. And he thinks, there's somebody who's coming after me. There's somebody, somebody's going to kill me. And all of a sudden, the ceiling breaks open. And all this plaster and this bestos comes down. And a, and a dead cat lands on his desk. And <laughs> he said, that was, uh, that was my welcome to the NFL moment. Unbelievable. Anyway, anyway Unbelievable. that's what, that's what Lurie has moved the franchise on from that to the Novacare. I think that's a good place to end today. Uh, if you enjoy <laughs> the podcast, do us a favor, rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For Barrett and Rube, I'm Dave. We will catch you next time on the Eagle Eye Podcast. <laughs>